crowd bears a portable shrine. People chant and dance. These are typical scenes at Matsuri, festivals held throughout Japan. Autumn is the peak season for Matsuri when festive music fills the air in communities all over the country. Prayers for bountiful harvests, for safe and secure family life, for the peace of the nation. Matsuri may embody all of these hopes and more. Matsuri are a precious example of shared heritage. Festivals have also nurtured various aspects of Japanese culture. Artisans produce their very best work to heighten the impact of these spectacular events held just once a year. Some Matsuri boast a tradition dating back a thousand years or more. The spirit of the festival is passed down from father to son. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we look at Japan's amazingly diverse festivals and the passion of the people who sustain these colorful traditions. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today I'm in the city of Hamamatsu, which is about an hour and a half out of Tokyo, southwest on the bullet train. Behind me in the distance are some big sand dunes and every year at the beginning of May there's a big festival held there. And one of the big attractions at that festival is a battle of giant kites. The origins of this go back over 400 years. There was a local samurai who had wanted a child for a long time and was finally blessed with a son and heir and his servants flew a kite to celebrate the birth of the child. And this is the Hamamatsu Festival Pavilion, where they have a number of displays relating to the festival. In recent years, every local neighborhood flies a kite at the festival in May, and this year the number of kites taking part was 174. They come in all different designs and sizes, but the biggest ones are about like this one on the wall behind me, which measures 3.6 meters squared. The Hamamatsu Festival happens to be centered on kites, but there are all kinds of different festivals held everywhere in Japan at a number of different times of the year, and local people take part in them with great enthusiasm. First of all, let's take a look at some of the major festivals around Japan. This waterfall in Wakayama Prefecture is called Nachi no Taki. It plunges 133 meters and is part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Right beside it stands Nachi Taisha, a shrine dedicated to the waterfall. Every July, this is the site of a fire festival called the Nachi no Himatsuri. People pray for a good harvest when the deity pays an annual visit to the waterfall. Many Japanese festivals take place at Shinto shrines. Countless Matsuri are held throughout Japan. The Aoi Matsuri in the ancient capital of Kyoto. People dress in costumes of the Heian Imperial Court and parade elegantly through the streets. The festival has a very long history. In the Heian period a thousand years ago, the Aoi Matsuri was the definitive festival for the people of Japan. Before the procession sets out, sacred rituals take place at a shrine. A shrine maiden, called the Sayodai, conducts a purification ritual and prays for peace. This is the Nebata Matsuri of Aomori Prefecture. Every August, it draws around three million spectators from far and wide.
The star attractions of this festival are nebota, gigantic paper lanterns. These illuminated floats present famous scenes from kabuki plays and Japanese history. People at local companies and organizations may spend the entire year making them. It all started with a tradition of setting small paper lanterns afloat on a river. But over the centuries, the matsuri evolved. Today, the biggest nebota are five meters high and nine meters wide. There are different legends about how the Nebata Matsuri began, but the word Nebata itself denotes drowsiness. People say the festival began as a way to get rid of drowsiness, which could interfere with work in the rice harvesting season. Another famous summer festival in the northeast of Japan is the Kanto Matsuri of Akita Prefecture. Kanto are bamboo poles with rows of paper lanterns hanging from them. They evoke glowing golden ears of rice. Around 230 kanto fill the streets in this festival, where the wish is for a good rice harvest. The biggest kanto weigh 50 kilograms. A single bearer carries each one and as part of the event, competes with the other bearers in spinning the canto and performing tricks with it. Each July, the Soma district of Fukushima Prefecture hosts an event called Noma Oi. This festival features the impressive spectacle of more than 500 riders on galloping horses. During Japan's period of medieval civil war, this district was part of the Soma domain. The festival began as a way of improving the fighting skills of the local warriors. Even today, people raise horses specifically for this festival. The climax is the launching of a sacred banner, literally a god flame. The horsemen vie to catch it as it falls. It's like watching a medieval battle come to life. Tokushima in Shikoku is home to the Awa Odori dance. The chant here is, you're a fool if you dance, you're a fool if you watch, you're a fool either way, so come on, let's dance. Flutes and drums provide musical accompaniment as a mass of dancers moves through the festival site. Some matsuri have connections to Buddhism. This is the Omizu Tori of the Buddhist temple Todaiji in Nara. The priests repent their sins and undergo penance on behalf of the people. They also conduct rituals to pray for the peace of the nation. Other Matsuri have links to foreign cultures. Nagasaki Kunchi dates back 400 years. During the Edo period, Nagasaki was the only Japanese port through which trade with the rest of the world was permitted. So people here take special pleasure in presentations associated with Holland and China, Japan's trading partners in those days. Some Matsuri involve the sea. In the subtropical islands of Okinawa, people observe the Ungami Matsuri. Ungami is the god of the sea. At the festival, the deity is welcomed and people offer prayers for a bountiful catch and harvest. Some festivals have only a short history and no religious associations. One example is the Yuki Matsuri of the city of Sapporo in Hokkaido. Each year, two million visitors come to admire more than 100 giant sculptures carved from ice and snow. Each part of Japan has its own distinctive festivals, and all of these traditions are preserved with great care. Festivals are very noisy, and right here they've got a display which is a reenactment of the evening part of Hamamatsu's kite festival. The kite flying takes place during the daytime, and then at night they have these very ornate floats which parade through the city's streets. 
the floats here in Hamamatsu are referred to as Goten Yatai. In different parts of Japan, they have different names and they have slightly different um, roles as well. But basically, uh, they're referred to as dashi, generally speaking. And their role is as sacred vehicles to carry a deity. With regards to the kite festival here in Hamamatsu, originally they were much smaller and they were just really wagons which were used to transport the kites. They took this form of this float here behind me in around the 1920s, although this one's much newer. This was built in 1992 to commemorate the 80th anniversary of Hamamatsu acquiring the status of a city. If you look at this up close, you'll see an amazing amount of detail in the wood carving. Many Japanese festivals have floats with very distinctive designs, which then become the centerpieces of their festivals. Then in addition to these, there are also many props and decorations and things, and local people will spend great amounts of time and effort in preparing these, working towards the festival. Next, let's take a look at how these activities have contributed to the development of Japanese culture in general. Many of the festivals in Japan arose from rituals to convey prayers and thanks for good rice harvests. People dance for a deity as a wish for a bountiful harvest. Over time, such simple festival customs evolved into complex performing arts. The harvest dances of the common people were called dengaku or sangaku. They were already popular and widespread in villages around Japan by about the 12th century. One essential prop in these dances was a mask. A mask allowed a dancer to become something other than human. As dengaku dances flourished, so did techniques of mask carving. Craftsmen created all kinds of masks, representing demons, mythical lions, and so on. Matsuri also influenced Japanese music. Locally made flutes and drums were used to play what is known as hayashi, a style of music with a distinctive rhythm. The masks, music, and dances of Matsuri form the basis of one of Japan's most famous performing arts, no theater. These days, no has an image of dignified performers wearing exquisite masks and moving sedately to the accompaniment of sophisticated music. But the roots of no theater lie in Matsuri. Festivals have also influenced Japanese crafts. Many Matsuri feature giant floats called dashi. These sacred vehicles of the gods are often sumptuously decorated with gorgeous textiles and fine carvings. Dashi are thought to have originated with the floats of Kyoto's Gion Matsuri in the 16th century. In a capital city recovering from a period of war and instability, the floats became ostentatious displays of local wealth. The Gion Matsuri continues to be held in Kyoto each July, when 32 floats trundle through the city. Each one of them is adorned with lavish decorations. On the side of this float is a Yuzen dyed fabric depicting a lion dance. Precious tapestries made in Belgium in the 16th century decorate this float. The floats of the Gion Matsuri are museums on wheels, showcasing treasures from around the world. Beautiful textiles like those displayed on the floats are still being made and restored today using highly advanced craft techniques such as yuzen dyeing and nishijin ori, a style of weaving. 
In this workshop, they make Nishijin Ori fabrics. One example is this piece depicting celestial maidens in Buddhist iconography. Tapestries like this usually take about nine months to complete. Matsuri emerge from local communities in every corner of Japan. And these festivals laid the cultural foundation for the development of many aspects of Japanese arts and crafts. Festivals are rooted in the very Japanese idea of dividing the days of the year into what they call hare and ke. Ke are just ordinary days where daily life goes on as normal. And hare are special days when a deity is thought to be present. And festival days are included in hare. The only thing is that festivals are not held on the same day everywhere. Because a festival is being held in one place on a certain day doesn't mean that it's a special day anywhere else. It might be a completely ordinary day. But people do look forward to their local festivals with great anticipation and start preparing for them way in advance. Now, in Hamamatsu, the festival here is a kite festival, as we've already seen. And in this display here, you can see there's a great number of vast kites, and people start preparing for making these a full six months ahead of the festival in May. They even cut down the bamboo and split it themselves to make the frames for the kites. Next, let's have a look at some people whose whole lives revolve around annual festivals. The Danjiri Matsuri is held in Kishiwada, Osaka every September. It attracts a boisterous crowd of around half a million spectators. The Danjiri of the festival's name denotes the giant four-ton festival floats that are hauled through the streets at breakneck speed. Here's one of them. It stands four meters high and is made entirely of Zelkova wood. The cost of constructing a Danjiri is roughly one million US dollars. Since the mid-19th century, exceptional master carpenters have adorned these floats with elaborate wood carvings. Each district has its own danjiri, and local people work hard to make it ready for the annual festivities. This workshop produces decorative wood carvings for danjiri. This is Nobuko Miyake, She's the first woman ever employed here to do such work. She was born here in Kishiwada. Ever since she was a little girl, she has loved the Danjiri Matsuri. Now in her fourth year of apprenticeship, she is being entrusted with carving duties for the first time. Around her, more senior apprentices execute complex carvings. The carvers use around 300 different chisels. Each one is just a few millimeters bigger or smaller than the chisel next to it in the lineup. Miyake is handling a simple carving. If she makes a mistake, she will have to start all over again. Will her boss give her a pass mark? Hmm. Okay, I guess. This is Miyake's first creative effort. Most aspects of the Danjiri Matsuri are dominated by men. She hopes to establish a new tradition of women creating decorative arts for the festival.
But her first goal is to match the skill of the senior carvers, and that challenge has only just begun. The Sua region of Nagano Prefecture. One festival here demands special skill and courage. It's called the Onbashirasai, and it involves shifting huge tree trunks using only human muscle power. Sua Taisha is a Shinto shrine at the heart of the local community. Sua Myojin, a deity of harvests, is enshrined here. In each corner of the shrine precinct stands a sacred pillar called an Ombashira. Once every seven years, they're replaced. Hauling the new timber forms the basis of the Ombashira Sai festival. Each local district and settlement has a part to play in hauling the sacred timber to the shrine. Preparations for hauling the Onbashira have begun. Stabilizers called medodeko are attached to the tree trunk. These keep the Onbashira balanced as it is being transported. This year, Hitoshi Kobayashi has been put in charge of one of the Ombashira. It's the most important role of all. Kobayashi's father, Suguru, was given the same job 30 years ago back in 1980. He did a great job leading his team. The Ombashira was hauled safely and Suguru had the privilege of sitting at the very top of the tree trunk for the climax of the event. Hitoshi Kobayashi was still young when he witnessed his father's success, and for years he has longed to emulate him. My old man definitely looked cool up there. I may not have his flair, but I can work just as hard. The Ombashira Sai is said to date back 1,200 years to the Heian period. Each tree trunk must be taken about 20 kilometers to Sua Taisha. The tradition of transporting these trunks by hauling them manually has been passed down from generation to generation. More than 2,000 local volunteers helped to get the sacred timber moving. Kobayashi leading his team is tense. There are countless obstacles to avoid, from the eaves of houses to power lines. In his job as team leader, Kobayashi has the vital responsibility of directing how the trunk is steered. Suguru Kobayashi is watching his son's progress intently. He seems much more relaxed now than he did at the beginning. <laughs> now comes the toughest part of all. This section of the route is a 27 degree hillside called the Tree Drop Slope. It brings tense moments for participants and spectators alike. This operation is extremely dangerous. If the tree trunk veers off course, people have been known to die. On this occasion, a different team does indeed run into trouble. It's a real test for the team leader. At last, the moment has come for Kobayashi to lead the tree drop. It's a wet day, making the steep slope especially slippery and dangerous. Kobayashi barks orders and rallies his men for the challenge ahead.
Kobayashi's onbashira appears over the lip of the slope. The log begins its descent. But on its way down, it rolls to one side. Instantly, Kobayashi shouts an instruction. Everyone acts in unison to restore balance by bringing the stabilizers down on the other side. The balance of the giant tree trunk is restored. Kobayashi's team have cleared the toughest hurdles safely. Now the time has come to erect the sacred pillars that have been hauled to Sua Taisha. Kobayashi is given permission to sit on the Ombashira. He has successfully followed in his father's footsteps, fulfilling a childhood dream. And his own son, Satoshi, is watching. From father to son, from son to grandson. An unbroken commitment stretching back 1,200 years and on into the future. Today we've had a look at several different Japanese festivals and I think you will have got a feel for how much the Japanese people love and enjoy their festivals. In a giant metropolis like Tokyo, there's very little sense of any real community on a day-to-day -day basis. But when the festival does come around every year, it's quite amazing how people do come together as a community. And I find it rather reassuring, I must say. Especially during this autumn season, there's a large number of harvest festivals. So if you're planning a trip to Japan in the near future, do check to see if there's going to be a festival while you're here. If there is, make a point of seeing it. You won't be disappointed. I'll see you again next time. Next time, we'll look back at the amazing story of the development of the Shinkansen bullet train, one of the fastest and safest trains in the world. <laughs>